It is an honor to introduce Rex Steven Sykes. He has dedicated over four decades to transforming minds and lives. Rex is a master in NLP, hypnotherapy, and the law of attraction. Highly sought after as a speaker, author, actor, and filmmaker, Rex inspires diverse audiences from CEOs to creatives to harness the power of their minds and achieve their dreams. Rex, welcome to the show. Well, I'm honored to be here, Lauren. Thank you for having me. How are you today? Uh, I'm doing well, thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to be here, thanks. So yeah, we were originally connected via Mo Rock and LA Tribune Leadership Week. So shout out to Mo and the LA Tribune family. Indeed, indeed. A great family to be part of. It really is. Rex, how did you originally get into the field of personal development? Um, like most people, I just was messed up and uh, wanted to change. I um, I spent my life in it, actually. I was a kid. My parents uh, put me in acting class and dancing classes when I was three years old and acrobatics. And I, and I started performing, not because they wanted me to, but to be well-rounded as a you know, in the arts kind of thing. And I was also raised in the Catholic Church. So what, um, use my phone, I'm trying to silence it. Um, so I was also very interested in what was going on with that guy in the front of the room. There was all this incense and costumes and, you know, mystic stuff and people kneeling and getting up and kneeling. And getting... I thought, well, this guy has some connection with God, so I got to find out what it is. And I asked my mom, mm. I said, you know, is there anything that you know we can do or their books or something i can so she started reading me different books from napoleon hill uh the, the bhagavad gita khalil gibran um joseph murphy you know i mean all sorts of well as waddles i mean anything we had around the house or could get from the library and uh, i started to read you know when i could read mm -hmm. on my own so i've i've been involved in that forever in my and my dentist was a, a practitioner of hypnosis. He didn't believe in Novocaine, so he would pull teeth without it, and he would do everything through, you know, relaxation techniques and hypnosis. So at eleven, I was like, you know, I want to learn from him. He was also a magician, so I and I got involved in magic around the age of five, and so I was doing tricks, and he was teaching me, and so he started to teach me these mm -hmm. hypnotic approaches, and so it just kind of one thing led to another. Um, but what I discovered, and I write about it in Life on Your Terms, is around the age of 25, I had a, a crisis in my life. And I had, while I knew all of the stuff I should do, and while I had practiced some of it, mm -hmm. I really hadn't mastered much of it. Mm -hmm. And so when the crisis came, I was at a loss. I, I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. But I knew I had to fall back into what I had learned early on. And so mm -hmm. I locked myself in my apartment for between six and eight weeks, I sat in a chair for you know anywhere from 12 to 20 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I meditated, I used hypnosis, and I did affirmations, I did everything I could. And uh, nothing seemed to work until about three weeks into it, I realized I was, while I was sitting in the chair trying to change, I was actually keeping the, the very same thing alive. I was going, why did this happen to me? Mm -hmm. How come things go wrong? Why have, how could I be so stupid? How long is it going to take, you know, for me to change? And I realized I didn't want to know that stuff. I wanted to know how I could be better, easier, faster, quicker, what I could do to to be uh, get outside of the problem that I had. And at that moment, I had a, a, an epiphany, an epiphany. And I and I and I describe it this way ever since dog crap or diamonds, the choice is yours. Mm. And I had spent so much time focusing on the dog crap, you spiraled down into despair and anger and frustration. Mm. And when I shifted from you know, what is wrong and why am I broken? What are the problems? What are my limitations? Why? Are, what are all my limiting beliefs and stuff like that? I then started to go, I don't need that stuff. I can release it. I can let go of it. I can forgive myself. I can just be free of it mm -hmm. and focus on this other stuff. So I not only like dog crap or diamonds, but a lot of people are one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat and they just sit there bobbling back and forth and they never really get anywhere. So either get off the boat and onto the dock or get off the dock and get onto the boat. Yeah. And and then go to wherever your destination is. Mm -hmm. Make a choice. So yeah, it's, it really is choosing, and most people never choose. They just allow circumstances and experiences and mm -hmm. uh, their conditioning to rule their life. So they live as victors and not vic uh, they live as victims and not victors. 
Yeah. So you were drawn to personal development from a young age. It sounds like I didn't know if it all began when this crisis happened. And tell us a little bit more about that crisis and what happened to you. Well, it was a transformational experience. I mean, the the the, the what happened was I had been misprescribed a, a combination of medicine that should have been fatal or at least put me in a coma, and it 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 screwed me up. But I could function, mm -hmm. and uh, but essentially gave me amnesia and and created all sorts of you know inner angst and anxiety. And so I didn't know what I was doing, and people thought I was losing my mind, and so did I. Yeah. And um, when I when I finally stopped the medication i was then so guilt ridden and sad and 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 confused that i then started abusing other drugs and alcohol and everything else so it just it kind of spiraled and led and at some point i you know i attempted to kill myself and that didn't work i was so mad i couldn't kill myself i'm like i can't succeed at anything i can't even yeah. i can't even kill myself right um so but thankfully i didn't and and the point is is that it doesn't matter i mean there are people who have far worse times in life than i do Mm -hmm. And I have, in some cases, far worse times than other people. It doesn't matter what the situation is or the experience or the reason mm -hmm. you come to personal change. I, I believe I was born for it. I mean, you know, it was it was my destiny. It was my choice. And I don't mm -hmm. I don't want to put any kind of mystical thing on it. It's just my path has always seemed to be toward finding a, a, a way of getting free from the the conditions of being born into society and and to live yeah. differently than than what would be otherwise or what most people live and and i don't want to put a judgment in there because it's not right. about judging mm -hmm. it's just about becoming aware becoming conscious becoming mm -hmm. alert to the to the opportunities the infinite opportunities and possibilities and resourcefulness within you and around you yeah and for those who aren't as familiar with your story was it the skydiving accident that yes. came before that's really intense can you bring us back to that moment and what exactly happened? Well, the skydiving accident wasn't that, I mean, terrific in the sense okay. that I had I had successfully parachuted to the ground. Okay. But in those days, it was a round shoot, not these ones that you step out of. And so uh, what people may not realize is that when you're descending, when your eyes are about level with the tree line or the horizon, you've mm -hmm. got about 200 feet before you hit the, the ground. Yeah. But 200 feet traveling at the rate that you're traveling at, even with a parachute takes a second, you know, or so. Mm -hmm. So I was so busy trying to hit this target and be the only one from my class <laughs> was actually in the rings. I, I didn't get the bullseye, but I was within the rings. I was so thrilled that mm -hmm. I, I forgot where I was and I looked up and I saw the tree and a hit. So I wasn't, I, I wasn't prepared to land. Mm -hmm. and so I wrenched, I completely wrenched my back. I mean, I was, oh I did some, some damage. I didn't, I didn't break my back or anything like yeah. that. Um, but you know, it was, it was excruciatingly painful and it mm -hmm. kept me awake and it kept me from doing my daily activities. So after, and I tried to hide it from my fiance at the time, and that wasn't a really successful thing to do. So I went to a doctor so he could give me medication. So because she didn't want me going skydiving in the first place. And I didn't want to have to say you were right. And I was wrong. So I tried to hide this yeah. and I went to the doctor and said, I need something to sleep. I need something to get through the day. Is there something I can have? And he goes, yeah, take this. Mm. I took that, mm -hmm. leaving his office. He gave me a little cup and some water and, and, and said goodbye and let me get in my car and drive. Yeah. And I went to pick up my sister in Hollywood. And she said, you were a completely different person. She said, I was terrified driving from you. You were not who you were. Yeah. And, um, and I didn't know. I mean, you know, it, and and this went on for months. And I would go to my acting classes and workshops, and 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 people were like, you know, something is wrong with you. I'm like, what are you talking about? But it it affected my short term memory. So I would leave a class, and I said, oh, I I left my wallet in the class. They said, oh, well, we gave it to your girlfriend. I'd call back a minute later, say, hey, you know, I just left class. I left my wallet, and they said, well, we gave it to your girlfriend. I said, I'd call back a uh -huh. minute later. You know, and and they were like, well, something's obviously must he must be drugged. He must be something. Right. Most of my friends started to abandon me. They're like, you're crazy. You're weird. You're, you know, and I was like, well, why are they leaving me? I mean, you know, I just couldn't right. see through what the, what the medication was doing. And, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, I fell out of a plane, you know, right. <laughs> broke, broke my body. but, but what I did was I broke my spirit in that fall yeah. and, and I learned, well, don't lie. That doesn't happen. Don't cover it up. You know, if you make a mistake, you, you know, own up to it because, the, the result of trying to hide it was far worse than if I just said, right. you know, I screwed up and, and I apologize. I'm going to go to a doctor. Yeah. 
Yeah. And of course I chose the 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 absolute worst doctor to choose. Right. Um, but you know what? Here's the thing. How else could it have been? You know, it, yeah. it, it is what it is. It happened and as it did. A series of things led to me going, wow, I need to do something mm -hmm. to change my life. So yeah. I, I look at the hardship as a true blessing. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody likes it going through it necessarily, but if you can, yeah, it's not that hard anymore. So it's the right. attitude is what, what's the good in this? Here's a blessing in this. I always land on yeah. my feet. And I've been and hardship and problems and struggles and difficulty has not been a stranger to me in my life. I mean, I live a great life, but at the same time, yeah, I live with whatever conditions anyone else lives with. It's just the differences in attitude mm -hmm. and awareness. Exactly. I welcome the challenge. I feel like I grow the most, I transform the most in these difficult moments. And it's what is this here to teach me instead of why is this happening to me? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. You're so right. So you've dedicated four decades now to helping countless others transform their minds and lives. What would you say is the secret to unlocking and experiencing more abundance in one's life? Well, first off, and I've already said it, but first off, you know, abundance means an amount. It doesn't mean that it's good or bad. We use it as if abundance is a good thing, like you have abundance of money and abundance of love and abundance of, but there's also an abundance of horror and abundance of harm and abundance of evil and abundance of negativity. There's problems. I mean, this is the nature of the universe. There's day and night. All batteries have a positive and negative pole. There's hot and cold, tall and thin, white and black. I mean, it's it's just the opposite. So it's not, it's, some people have an abundance of problems and difficulty and other people have an abundance of wealth and love and all the good stuff. So it's about choice. Mm. It's about realizing what you're creating that the outer world that we live in is really a reflection of what goes on here and people go well i'm not trying to create crap it's not that you're trying to create it yeah it's that you're letting whatever happens happens because you're not managing what you could be managing mm -hmm. so if i have a garden and i don't if i don't take care of it it can get overgrown it can die it can you know whatever and that's what happens with people when they don't manage their thoughts and their feelings they don't watch what they say and how they act or behave so it really starts with a conscious appreciation of I am a creator, mm -hmm. I am a manifester, and everything that happens, I'm responsible for. Yeah. Now, even if that's not true, I mean, because some people argue that and they don't want to take responsibility, or some people say, well, you're putting the blame on the person. No, what it does is it puts the person in the driver's seat of their vehicle so that they can decide where they want to go and what they want to see along the way and whether they enjoy it or not. Yeah. So it's about choice, but it's about accepting accountability. Stop whining, sniveling, complaining, excusing, and blame, blaming, mm -hmm. and accept it, and then release and let go and forgive, and then love and be compassionate. The strongest emotion in the world, according to everybody, is love. Love is the greatest, right? Mm -hmm. So love yourself, love the world, love what's going on, love everything around you all of the time. Go, I'm so lucky, you know, I'm so lucky, you know, and have a good time because yeah. the alternative is dog crap. Right. Start living with more intention and choosing how you who you want to be. Like, how do I want to feel today? Who do I want to be today? It makes a difference. It absolutely does. And that's the the one thing that we're not taught growing up is that you get to decide who you will be moment to moment. <clears throat> and if you set certain things in motion, it's not like every second you're sitting there going, okay, now what, now what, now what? But you set in motion these habits and patterns. And what most people have done is they grew up with the habits and patterns they learned from the people around them. Mm -hmm. We're sponges during our early life. I mean, we really absorb the values and the the upside and downside of all of the people around us and the media and the you know. And um, and so we don't act with volition or intention mm -hmm. because we're not taught that. We're taught get a job, work hard, you know, pay taxes, die, leave something to somebody if you can. And now we know no, almost none of that is true from society. You know, they've, they've kind of shifted the game for us. So it's time that people, and, and what I love about what's going on right now in the world with all of the, you know, stuff going, is that it's a, it's a wake up call. Mm -hmm. It's in, and, I'll, and I'll share this story. I share it often, if you don't mind. Please. In my apartment in Los Angeles, the same one I locked myself in, and I'm not always a quick learner. I had a teapot and the whistle in the teapot was broken. So I would go put the water on in the kitchen. I'd come back in the living room. I'd sit down in the very chair. I did my transformation or, uh, you know, somewhere else. And and I would wait. And then I would hear this noise. The water is obviously boiling. And I would run into the kitchen tonight. And it hadn't boiled. And I was like, no, you know. 
it took me, I always say it took me about a year. I don't honestly know how long it took me, but at some point I realized water is noisier before it boils. Mm -hmm. And scientifically, this is, as it gets to be two, 209, 10, 11 degrees, all those molecules are banging. The atoms are getting all this energy because of the heat, the ad, you know energy added to it. So it gets really noisy, but when it hits 211 degrees, mm -hmm. or 212, 212 degrees, um, it converts to steam. There's a transformation. And when it converts to steam, it releases this energy and the water slows down into a, a rolling boil. So it gets quiet. Mm. So it took me a long time to, to go, don't go running to the teapot when it's noisy, mm. go to the teapot when it quiets back down. Mm. So what's happening in our universe for me is that the water's making a lot of noise. Yeah. Politically, religiously, yes. economically, yes. Uh, the wars and you know, because like, all around the world is making this noise. Yeah. Which means we're on the verge of transformation, but we have a choice about what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And here's here, Lori, you know, you, you appreciate. It. We could live in a world rent free. I mean, we were born into a world that doesn't have any borders on it, no, no geographic lines, no signs that said, "Hey, if you're born here or there, you got to pay for it." That's a societal thing. That's human made. We could live in a rent free world with enough money, with enough food, with enough energy, with enough peace for everyone on the planet and the only reason we don't is because we're willing to tolerate the ones who put into place the idea of work for a job and this all pretty much rose during you know the industrial revolution but work for work for an employer pay rent be taxed have borders mm -hmm. and and hate the people outside your borders you know and and hoard everything you can mm -hmm. so the only thing that keeps us from it's like the socrates said don't don't tear down what you don't want, build what you would have instead, right? Stop fighting what, you know, build what you want, don't don't fight what you don't want. And that's why the world is where it is, is because whether you believe in the hundred monkey principle or tipping points or any of this, so, yeah. is the idea that if you want a new reality, you have to be able to conceive of that reality. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to say, I, live in a, I can live in a rent-free world with plenty of abundance, with good for all, with love and peace and compassion, but most people won't do that because they're so busy preoccupied by the news and the media and scrolling on their phones that they're mm -hmm. distracted from setting that as an attention. But I think we're at that place where kids and women, especially women and kids today, are going, hey, we don't want this anymore. Yeah. We're tired of the old regime. Let's build something new and better. So yeah. thank you for being part of that movement, Lauren. Oh, it's my pleasure. I think a lot more people are turning to self-help and personal development and it's because it's trying times out there. Yeah. Well, it, it is. And yet that's the that's the one thing I try to make sure I'm not saying. If I say it's trying times, because there's a lot of thought gurus that are going, oh, it's hard, it's terrible, it's tough, mm -hmm. it's confusing, it's can't. I'm like, yeah, that's just more fear mongering. Okay. You know, what it is, is it's an opportunity to to express yourself, yes. to discover yourself, to become authentic and mm -hmm. to create what you want mm -hmm. in spite of what, how we judge okay. the circumstances. Look at, look at that mindset flip. You know, it's important how we think about it. And it is an opportunity for us to dive in, do this inner work, think about who we want to be in the future that we want to create. Right. Right. And, and we're the only ones who can do it for ourselves and, and for those around us. You know, there's a lot of people who who have programs and they write books and they speak and they're very popular and they make lots of money and they're all over the internet and they're wrong. Mm. They want people, I mean, think about it. I know you know this, but I mean, for, for our audience, think about this for a second. Some of these people go, well, you know, if we want the car, if you want the house, if you want the trophy spouse, if you want the jewelry, if you want the leisure and all that kind of stuff, you work really hard, you sweat, you sacrifice, you give up everything so that you can become someone of, importance and be famous and happy and yet the truth of the matter is that so many people who get famous and money and all that stuff find that it's hollow it's empty there's nothing about things that make us happy it's if you're it's who you are that determines whether you're happy with the things that you have or don't have because there are people around the planet who have nothing and are deliriously happy and then there are those people who have everything who are deliriously upset and and despairing and and sad and depressed mm -hmm. and I'm sure you do. I get called into millionaire and billionaire homes all the time going, look what I have, look what I've accomplished. And then I don't like myself, you know, and I'm sad and they turn to drugs or alcohol or something worse and, and they don't understand it. So the thing is, it's not the chasing of things that's important. It's the becoming your authentic self, 
learning how to do that. If you become the kind of person for whom manifesting is easy, then you'll manifest easily. Mm -hmm. So it's transforming yourself by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. And the best part about that Bible quote is be not conformed to the world. So don't be of the world, be apart from the world. Don't be of the world. Don't be conformed to it. Don't pay attention to it, but re transform yourself by the renewing mm -hmm. of your mind. And then it's a heart and head thing that, that, you know, yeah. needs to be aligned. But when that happens, transformation can happen mm -hmm. and, and we don't have to suffer anymore. Even in, in conditions where we would otherwise suffer, we can choose a different way of being. And, and, you know, sometimes yeah. ignorance is bliss. I think what's really important is defining success or life, as you would put it, on your terms. Yes. And that doesn't mean that success or happiness in life comes from the big house, the nice car, the jewelry, what have you. It really is feeling good about who you are and deciding who you want to be and how you want to feel. Well, I think, that, yeah. And I think the first purpose of manifestation is to transform yourself, not to have a house or a car or a business or success or monitor. But you're absolutely entitled to those. You can absolutely have them, but become the kind of person who can easily manifest it and who can enjoy those. Yeah. And then, and how do you do that? You serve people. Mm. In other words, if people who chase money oftentimes don't get money. They get frustrated. People who, who want to serve, who, who offer things. I mean, think about all the innovation in the world, whether it's the radio, the TV, the computer, the spoon, mm -hmm. you know some spandex pants, whatever, these people get rich because they're serving all these people. They're putting something out there that is for the, the population, you know, and if, if there's 8 billion people on the planet, if every one of them gave you a dollar, you know, yeah. so, so, but if you're just trying to gab the dollar or just grab the car, yeah. or just grab the, so yeah. it's we do have, which you know, but yeah. a lot of people don't because the thought leaders are so-called, I call them empty suits. Men and women, <laughs> they appeal, you know, they got the marketing down, but the messaging is wrong. Right. And they're willingly giving out the messaging because they just, you know, get yeah. get more people to them. Yeah. So if they can, if they can say, hey, look, you, you want, I mean, this, think about it. This has been the consumerism of the United States since, since Edward Bernays, the, the nephew of Freud, created the field of propaganda, which later became the field of public relations. And that was... How do you get people to separate the money from themselves to buy not just one TV set, but two TV sets, but a TV set for every room? And, you know, if the neighbors have two cars, well, then you need two or three cars. I mean, that's what society has been put on us. And and yet there are people yeah. who have nothing who are more alive, yeah. more, alive more aware, more thrilled yeah. to be alive mm -hmm. than the people who have everything. Yeah, I love this conversation because so much of my learning in this, it's not about me. You know, it's about sharing my message and like how I can find a way to help others. And that's where I feel like true um, fulfillment and happiness comes from is through helping others rise. It's it's so amazing. I mean, we've always had tribes and bands and 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 groups that have fought over resources. I mean, it's not new to humans, mm -hmm. but there was also at one time like communities and they would do things like get together and do barn racing they would help somebody mm -hmm. put their barn up or their you know their uh till their soil or something because it benefited everyone to be able to do that and now we've gotten so isolated when we went from being an agrarian society to a industrial society to an information society that we now live in boxes and work on boxes and drive in boxes and you know i mean we don't connect the same way and community you know, the other online communities, but it's not the same as people saying, you know, I love you. You're part of my, my family. You know, how can I help you? And and that's what's, that's what's missing. But I think that's where people are waking up. And again, especially among the women and among the young people. Mm -hmm. Speaking of community, if I understand this correctly, you have lived in a Rajneesh commune where they taught NLP. I'd love yeah. to hear more about that experience and how it contributed to your understanding of human development. Wow, well, that's a great question, and it and it, that time of my life was uh, wonderful. I mean, you know, living in an ashram, is, people think it's oh, it's got to just be blissful. You know, you're meditating all day long. Well, yes and no. I mean, every button that could be pushed in in your consciousness is pushed because to live in a commune is like to say, well, I'm trying to be egoless. So if you're trying to be egoless, then everything that 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 could uh, offend your ego will be there. I mean. <laughs> 
So, it, no, but I mean, it's really, it's amazing. I, 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 if you don't mind me sharing, the commune was beautiful. I mean, we we built this city in the middle of nowhere in this desert. And um, with the idea that we would uh, not uh, intrude upon nature, but but collaborate with nature. So it was an agrarian community. We raised enough to not only support the commune of of, of anywhere from two to 20,000 people, but to sell it otherwise. We also had you know, a, a, a media center where we were producing books and tapes and audio programs that went out all around the world. We had discotheques and restaurants wow. around the world. I mean, it was it was quite a, an incredible thing. And it was an experiment mm -hmm. to see if people could live together in this kind of environment cooperatively and, and meditatively. That said, in any community, uh, commune or otherwise, there can be problems. There's problems in the Catholic church. There's problems in the city you and I live in, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's so... People say, well, that was a cult and you lived in a cult and there were problems. I'm going, same with where I live today, you know, or outside of the commune. It's, it's no different. It's just a little bit more intense. So for, for those people, no one ever asked me for money. Nobody asked me to give my life to the guru. Nobody told me I had to do one thing or the other. It was based on meditative awareness and choice. But we were the first community in the country to recycle as a, as a uh, policy. We had the first debit card in the United States, and they thought that that must be communistic. No one could understand that. They would go, well, you're giving your money to the guru. We'd go, no, we're putting our money in a bank, and we have a plastic card that represents that money. So we go to our boutiques and our stores and our cafes in the city that we created in the middle of nowhere, and we use it as, an ex as a medium of exchange. It just is debited from our account. And they couldn't figure that one out. That was, oh, you know. So... Um, so it was really, really wonderful. I was there for the duration of it, and I was there in the end of it, and um, it was beautiful. It was just truly, truly amazing because every and then when the in and I, and I could come and go whenever I wanted. So if I was outside the commune, we had for, as a sannyasin, which is what we we're called, an adherent of the process of meditating. Right? Mm -hmm. We would wear the colors of the sunrise, so we wore red clothing or purple or orange, you know that kind of. We wore a mala, which was a, a beads of 108 beads, which represented 108 forms of meditation. And we took a new name. So my name is Swami Anand Nito. And I, and I, you know, I'm in this, thank you. Namaste. <laughs> when I would come back, you know, from the 80s, I would say namaste, namaste. Nobody knew what it meant. So all my workshops, I would say, this is what namaste means. Now people say namaste all the time. I mean, it's yeah. cool how things with NLP and everything seeps yeah. into the, the vernacular and the, and the, uh, the zeitgeist of it. But so I, I knew this because there was opposition to the commune from outside it. And there was opposition to the outside from within the commune. I mean, there were factions that that didn't like each other, apparently, because they were at odds with what both were trying to accomplish. However, there were people who opened fire on the commune from the outside. They actually we had one of the largest uh, transportation systems in the city, in the state of Oregon, yeah. 300, you know, yeah. buses or whatever. And the, all the police officers, I mean, and they were elected officials, you know, government officials, mayors and all that. Kind of, but the uh, police officers were all Oregon State trained and someone shot the horse of the police, chief of police, killed the horse. Oh, my gosh. They really didn't kill any human, but they, you know, they anyway, um, because we didn't allow hunting in the in in a hundred square mile or the, the size okay. of the yeah. And at one time people hunted and, you know, deer hunted and stuff. So they were mad at us. Um, but the point is, is I would get up in the morning um, and I would put on my what I call the clown suit. It would be no different than if I had little curry bulbs and a big nose and floppy <laughs> shirt and orange, which yeah. to me was the hardest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. I went from blue jeans and brown shirts to orange right. and red. I was like, oh, God, this is tough. I took the new name. Meditating an, an hour or more a day wasn't a problem. And wearing the beads wasn't so much an hour problem, but the clothes. Mm. But what it did was, I mean, we'd been—I've been chased out of restaurants with tire irons. I've been, uh, you know, attacked. I've been told I should be shot in the LAX airport uh, because of how I dressed. Yeah. And what I realized, and it was a, an incredible lesson, was it gave me—and this it's a device. It was the idea of: Do I react to the way people? look at me and how they treat me or do or does it not matter mm -hmm. and and so i i learned to let it go and so people would go well you know you're one of those red freaks and whatever and i go okay you yeah, know sure i am sure. i am yeah or they say that i was like okay whatever it's you know it it, it really was uh the the opportunity to use 
uh, uh, I don't want to say innocuous, but in some ways it's innocuous, but in other ways it's very deliberate um, form of, of standing out in a crowd. Yeah. So what it occurred to me was, um, what I appreciated were there were people who could see past the beads and the orange clothes who wanted to know me because what I wore didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And there were those people who wanted to hate me because of what I was wearing, you know, and didn't care to know me. Yeah. So I'm like, they're looking at the clothes. They're not looking at me. And so who am I in all of this? So it was a waking up for me. But what I did come to discover and what I knew very, very well is that I could go into a gas station that refused to serve me, go to the restroom, take out blue jeans and a shirt and change into common everyday clothes, walk back out and be served, mm -hmm. but not in my red clothing, right? And it occurred to me then and there, and I had never done that, but it occurred to me then and there that there's people who can't take off their gender, they can't take off their skin color, they can't take off you know, who they are, their, mm -hmm. their abilities or disabilities, that they're born and that's it. But I could, I chose not to, but yeah. I could do that. And that, and that made such an, an impression on me about how the world treats people mm -hmm. uh, that it doesn't understand. Yeah. And that what we really need to do is come together with harmony. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like this. And it's like, if I say, I don't like X or I like X, a lot of people say, well, I don't like X. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to use any politics, right, or, right, right. but the, instead of saying, oh, that's interesting. Why don't you like it? Or why do you like it? In right. other words, instead of us being yeah. sure about how did you come to that conclusion? Yeah. No, that's anything. Not so that you can say, no, that's stupid. It's dumb. I've got a better way, but to really be fascinated. Well, so your life experiences and the different things had led you from here to here, to here, to here, to here. And that's why you have adopted these positions that's fascinating without mm -hmm. judging it and yet few people will ever do that yeah we as humans have this need to prove that we're right instead of exploring someone else's viewpoint and learning something instead we're just saying no that's wrong this is how it is but it's a missed opportunity right no you're right and going back to the nlp stuff and everything um, we had a university, it was Rajneesh International Meditation University, and we taught all sorts of different things and studied all sorts of body work and um, Tantra and meditative practices and NLP and, and uh, aggressive therapy practices and very gentle and permissive. Very, and so as a member of the university, as, as well as a facilitator at times, I, I, there were so many programs and workshops that, you know, we spent day in yeah. and day, and hour and hour, you know, working on ourselves from, you know, like like violent encounter groups, not meaning violent between people, but like beating, you know, the hell out of a out of a pillow with a, a batak or something and screaming and raging to try and get all that stuff out, yeah. you know, or dancing and celebrating or shaking violently or doing any mm -hmm. number of different kinds of practices mm -hmm. to awaken the energy in the body or the kundalini. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah. and so, uh, you know, there were, there were people who were in the commune for, you know, from the sixties with Bhagwan, until he closed and I was, you know, involved maybe for 10 years until he died. And then, uh, and then after, until he died and I still am, I mean, I still consider myself a sannyasa. I just stopped using the Swami name because I stopped using it. Yeah. What an incredible experience. It, it, no, it was beautiful. And people, people who, who have read books or, you know, they've seen um, wild, wild country on uh, Netflix. Yeah. By the way, you know, I watched that whole series and a guy called me up one day, a friend of mine I've known since the 70s. He said, you're in Wild Wild Country. And I said, no, I'm not. He goes, yeah, you are. I said, no, I'm not. I watched the whole thing. He said, well, check out, I think it was episode five. And sure enough, there I am. And I was like, oh, wow, I, I completely missed myself. I don't know how I did. Wow, you were in it? Yeah, you know, I show up in some of the books and stuff. But yeah. if you ever see the series, I'm the guy who gets hit in the face with a bunch of flowers. Uh, <laughs> I'll look out for you. Yeah, yeah. If you want, I yeah. think it's I think it's the fifth installment. I have to go back. But uh, Ma Prem Sunshine, who was a spokesperson for Bhagwan, uh, as he was doing his drive by, he said, "Sunshine takes the flowers," and I was standing there. She takes this huge, huge thing of roses off the car and slaps me in the face with it. You know, as oh she turned gosh. It. and and they captured that on video, wow. and uh, and so it showed up in the show. Wow. A, a younger version of me with yeah. dark hair, more hair. And, <laughs> you know, so. oh, well, I know we both align on this concept of present moment awareness. What are some tips you have to cultivate mindfulness and really be here now? 
That's a great one. Breathe. Mm. You know, the breath is where our life is. It's without breathing and everything. Think about it. Everything in the universe in this world respirates, essentially. Mm -hmm. We don't know if the rocks are doing it, but certainly any living organism has a form of exchange with the inner and the outer universe. So by mm -hmm. watching your breath, by breathing, by connecting with it, mm -hmm. the, the practice of Vipassana, the ability to watch your breathing um, is, is a great way to fall into the moment. I, You know what? I, one of the things I love to do, I love to go sit outside and just listen to the song that the leaves make from the different trees. Mm -hmm. Because one rattles this way and another brushes this yeah. way and another whispers that way. And, you know, and, 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 or, and I'll sit there and listen and, and everything goes on at once, but attention tends to go. So the dog barks and you hear that and the car says that and the child does this and that, yeah. but it's this symphony that is occurring simultaneously and sequentially. And to just drop into that and allow yourself to bathe in that experience mm -hmm. um, to, to, you know, practice, you know, there's, there's Zen like practices of when you're washing a dish, just wash the dish and don't yes. be thinking about other stuff. Uh, when you're eating, just actually eat and don't be watching TV or reading books. Mm -hmm. If you're on the treadmill at the gym, be on the treadmill at the gym and, yeah. and allow yourself to feel your body instead of, you know, looking at a book or listening to something or watching the TV screen. Uh, every, so much of our world is designed to take our attention from ourselves and put it out there. Mm -hmm. And then when out there happens, we go, well, see, that's, that's, it ruined my day. How could, how could something ruin your day? Okay. I mean, right, right. So, so, I, so the idea of just taking and taking moments and here, the cool part about the human is that the more moments you take, like the bit by bit by bit, you know, the jug fills drop by drop is what Buddha said. Um, all those little bits have an accumulative effect and a powerful effect so if you practice it a little bit every day mm -hmm. um then ultimately you you gain the benefit and the experience of it yeah i found myself on a walk yesterday and i've started leaving my phone at home when i go on a nature walk so that i can really be present on the walk instead of listening to a podcast or responding to emails and so i was on my walk yesterday and i found myself lost in thought and i said lauren stop tune into the trees the birds and they're singing so beautifully and i was like wow this is all here for us if we only choose to pay attention and that moment that you have and i say this to the other people is the moment that you go i just became aware that i was lost in thought and to change my focus and to acknowledge it and 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 somebody can get home and they can go oh my god the whole time i was lost in thought I just realized that the whole, you know, I mean, in other words, people, if you think about their negative self-talk and the, and the reprimands and the criticism that most people, have, for you to say, Hey, Lauren, I can pay attention to this mm -hmm. and notice it now is such a beautiful thing. It was a it's special just, moment. Yeah. And, and most people miss it because they're too busy chiding themselves or beating themselves or flagellating themselves to try and be different mm -hmm. instead of going, wow, I just noticed something pretty cool. Because what else do you have in that moment that, that could be more important than whatever it is you're doing exactly in that moment? When I was a kid, and I, I think this is probably a universal experience, I used to lie in the backseat of my parents' car on the floor while we were driving to a relative's house or somewhere across country and go, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Come on, are we there? Can we stop? I hate this. I hated going from place to place. I liked being in the new place, but I didn't yeah. like getting to it. And and sadly, that's what a lot of people do in life. You know, it's like all you have is the journey. You mm -hmm. may never get to that other destination. So yeah. you might as well enjoy where you're at right now, wherever that might be. Mm -hmm. Because if tomorrow doesn't come or something changes or you choose to go to a different destination, you know, mm -hmm. so enjoy the journey, you know, mm -hmm. and, and allow yourself to, to fully celebrate being alive because, hey, yeah. There may be a time when you're not in this form. Mm -hmm. And I don't, it's not about the destination. It is about the journey, but I believe that the destination will be better if you're fully immersed in each moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and that, and that too, you know, um, Napoleon Hill toward the end of his life said of the 520 people that I modeled for Carnegie's philosophy, you know, Schwab and, you know, all the different people, um, he said only one had a good life, a balanced life. And that was Edward Burroughs, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, or John Burroughs, the naturalist who sought peace and balance. He said all the rest of them, or most of the rest of them, um, because they chose cash over peace and, and balance, 
Uh, and he says there's nothing wrong with cash. You obviously can have it, but it's it's how you get it that matters. And I don't mean the acquisition, but the mindset behind it. Many of them became alcoholics or drug addicts, or they lost their money and died broke. They ended up in mental institutions where they killed themselves. And he said their children also, and he said, I knew many of the kids were also have problems because they never grew up learning how to create wealth and then manage it. Mm-hmm. You know, if they got it and then, you know, just did whatever they did with it because so the the point being is that that even Hill was saying, you know, the whole thinking grow rich isn't just and he said that in the in the law of success and in thinking grow rich, but people miss that. It's not really just about money. It's about what you're able to create and manifest by transforming yourself again, kind of by the renewing of your mind and to seek a larger I mean, that's why I always says go the extra mile, you know, find service, have a pleasing person. I mean, he, he gives you the, the components of it, but to live your life mm-hmm. so that you're fulfilled. Mm-hmm. And then he says, if you do these things, then the money also can come in. It yeah. can come so quickly that it can scare yeah. you. because You'll wonder where the heck has it been all this time? And it suddenly mm-hmm. shows up, you know, yeah. it says it's been released because it's not that it's, and what he's saying is it's always been there. Mm-hmm. You just couldn't see it because you were in your own way. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. Rex, is there a mantra that you live by? I do. I do. You know, and I, and I close out my shows and I close out my blogs and everything. I always say, you know, if you consider it a problem, it's a problem. And if you consider it a blessing, it's a blessing. So celebrate everything. So my mm-hmm. mantra is celebrate. Everything. Celebrate everything. And as we wrap up, you're the author of the book. We can see it behind you. Life on our terms. The life, life on your terms, okay. life on your terms. <laughs> What do you hope your readers gain from this book? Well, what I hope they get is that, that you know, knowledge and information doesn't change you. Mm-hmm. What changes you is the application of the knowledge and the information. You have to put it into use. I'm an actor. Mm-hmm. And so I've taught acting and the screenwriters, you know, say, well, the script is important. The actors say, no, the actor is important. Mm-hmm. So how I demonstrate that is I would take the script, I would throw it on the ground and I would go act. And obviously the screenplay just sits there. So if the book just sits there, if you read it once like a novel to get through it, like a lot of people read books, you will miss it. But if you make a study of it and you apply what's in the book, you can transform your life in so many incredible ways. And what I'm proud about the book is people are getting that from the book and it's designed in such a way to make it easy and, and digestible. And so, and so, you know, it's helping people transform their lives Mm -hmm. and to be happier and healthier and wealthier in all sorts of ways. And, Mm -hmm. and so, but it is the, it's knowledge. If you know, but you don't do, you don't really know. Yeah, it's so true. I was a forever student at one point, all the different certifications, degrees, but I wasn't teaching. I wasn't helping. I just stored all the knowledge inside of me. And what, what, what good does that do? Right. 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 And by the way, it, it, you know, I see on my screen, it says rexlikes.com book. If people go there, they can get the book, but on top of it, your, your viewers who are watching can get a bonus training on mastery and how we learn and master our skills, our emotions, our mindset, and who we are to make the changes in life. There's a, there's a, I give that as a bonus to the people who have gone and purchased the book and come back and follow the instructions there at the website. Wonderful. Thank you. I'll put that all in the show notes. Oh, cool. Next, cool, cool. Um, is there anything you'd like to leave our audience with today? Yeah, Lauren, you're amazing. And this uh... is fantastic. <laughs> and I'm so happy that we had this time together and that people should tune in and watch you and whomever your guests are because you really deliver value and the opportunity for people to speak and share and to reach out and touch people around the world is, is truly a glorious thing. So namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much, Rex. And where can our listeners find you? At rexsykes.com. They can find me. They can find, I've got two other websites. There's rexsykes.tv because I do my show, Create Your Best Life with Rex at rex.tv.tv and rexsykes.club. So calm TV and club are the last parts. Okay. A lot of new offerings are coming up and they can find me in any one of those or they can Google me and I'll show up everywhere. You know. And they- <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me and have a beautiful and blessed day.